Welcome to the wonderful world of American political thought uh, during the week of Monday, February 15th to Friday, February 19th, and particular to the magical world of Module 2. Now, as I mentioned in my previous module, um, I didn't quite have time to finish my de Tocquevillian introduction, um, so let me pick up where we left off. And I was reading two selections from Democracy in America. One, the conclusion to volume one, which as I explained in module one, uh, de Tocqueville thought that that was going to be the whole thing. But then when his friend Beaumont had composed his novel, he decided that that wasn't the comprehensive examination of American cultural habits, modes of thought and feeling. Um, so he went back and then completed volume two. And that's why uh, democracy in America consists of volume one and volume two. Now, um, I was, uh, and I'd given you four reasons why it's central, cent essential to study American politics through the lens of de Tocqueville. And I, and the last one was his ability to f see forward. Now, let me just say then, in volume two, de Tocqueville then examines our, the way we think, the way we feel and express our cultural habits and how the different aspects of American culture um, and American behavior are part of our regime, the world of mores, and you'll see uh, that the Tocqueville's distinction between laws and mores, between institutional or explicit political life and the larger life of the, um, of the society are actually all aspects of politics. Even though, as Cropsey points out, and we'll see when we go through his article, we are unique, uh, not so unique anymore, because all modern regimes have tried to imitate our aspects of this. We try to separate out the narrow institutional life of our country and its political system called what Cropsey calls the parchment regime, the regime that exists in official parchments, parchments and documents um, from the larger personal and individual lives that we live. We call that the distinction between the public and private, and, and we'll see. We'll explore that tension in Cropsey's article, but it's a part of American life. And uh, and so de Tocqueville's point is that, yes, you can make a distinction between the official parts of a regime, the documentary or institutional parts, the, the public part, and our private lives, but actually the way that you and I live our lives, both individually and collectively, are profoundly influenced by the political society that we live in. And that's those larger elements of the regime which we'll examine in the, um, a, a little bit further in this module, uh, in the notes, is again, is you can't exclude the social and cultural dimensions of a people from its political arrangements. And de Tocqueville thought that, and that, that whole area of life he called mores, as we call mores, uh, it's, it's from the, the French word meur, which means customs um, or, or uh, social habits. So, um, in part, in volume two then, and, and when we turn to Tocqueville, of course, I'll explain more of the structure of the book and its layout and that kind of stuff. But, uh, but in volume two, he turns to what we are as a people, culturally, intellectually, emotionally, artistically, etc. And in the last part, it, volume two has four subparts, parts one, two, three, and four. And in the last part, de Tocqueville directs his gaze not only to America's future, but to the future of the entire human race. On the presumption that uh, all of humanity, uh, for all kinds of reasons, because of technology, because of commerce, because of the unfolding of modern thought, that eventually all of humanity will become uh, under the spell of democratic institutions and ideas. And, um, and we will prosecute that idea when we examine um, um, de Tocqueville's view of modernity. But, but again, he, gazes, he, he wants to see what's in store for the human race under this great change between um, the prior royal and aristocratic pa political past of humanity and the democratic future of humanity, with, of course, America standing at the fulcrum. And that's why, if you go back to Cropsey and why 1776, which is the beginning of our nation, remember what happened in 1776 was the first time that a nation tried to embody the emergent and developing principles of modern political philosophy. So America was, strictly speaking, the first modern nation. 
um, founded upon modern democratic principles. Um, and de Tocqueville thought that's the, that was going to be the template for uh, the coming centuries of humanity. So in the last part of volume two, he kind of gazes. So what does he see? And I have to tell you, I'll tell you right now, Tocqueville's not an optimist about the future. Uh, in fact, his vision of the coming democratic ages is rather grim. If that's perhaps that's too strong, but but and as you're going to see, de Tocqueville's pretty even-handed, because when we turn to Volume One, Part Two, Chapter Six, it's his great fulcrum chapter where he he holds up for you the aristocratic past of humanity and the democratic future of humanity and says, well, what's better? And it turns out, like any other even-handed observer of human life, there are certain advantages to aristocracy and certain advantages to, dis to d democracy. And there are also disadvantages to both. To both. So one thing that you'll see is de Tocqueville takes us through his analysis of American politics and American democracy is there are good things and bad things about our regime, um, and in fact, all regimes. That's the Aristotelian component of the Tocqueville's analysis, because Aristotle argued that this being human life, there's no such thing as perfection. And that Aristotelian insight in the imperfectibility of human arrangements on earth is, is an insight that also undergirded the, the founders. I mean, some of you have had me for American government, therefore I've had you tattoo Federalist 10 and 51 on your arms. And you know, one of the famous phrases that Madison says in Federalist 51 is, is if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Well, we're not angels. Uh, surprise. Uh, so um, so uh, with that in mind, de Tocqueville, in, in turning his prophetic gaze forward, what can America expect in the coming centuries? What can humanity? And in chapter, uh, in volume two, part four, chapter six, the title of which is, What Sort of Despotism Democratic Nations Have to Fear? I'm just going to read this selection, and, and you'll see in some ways the Tocqueville's view of the coming ages of humanity co comports with um, Acropsis in some ways, as you'll see in Nietzsche's. So on page 691 of our edition, here's what he says. Thus, I think that the type of oppression which threatens democracies is different from anything there has ever been in the world before. Our contemporaries will find no prototype of it in their memories. I myself have vainly searched for a word which will ex exactly express the whole of the conception that I have formed. Such old words as despotism and tyranny do not fit. The thing is new, and as I cannot find a word for it, I must try to define it. I am trying to imagine a world, uh, a tragedy under what novel features despotism, uh, and by the way, just for your information, despotism and despotic, despot, come from the Greek word despotes, which means master or dictator or like master as, as opposed to slave. So despotism means a situation in which people are enslaved to their government. I'm trying to imagine under what novel features despotism may appear in the world. In the first place, I see an innumerable multitude of men, alike and equal, constantly circling around in pursuit of the petty and banal pleasures which which they glut their souls. Um, uh, each one of them, withdrawn into himself, is almost unaware of the fate of the rest. Mankind, for him, consists in his children and his personal friends. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, they are near enough, but he does not notice them. And though he still may have a family, one can at least say that he has not got a fatherland. Over this kind of men stands an immense protective power, um, which is alone responsible for securing their enjoyment and watching over their fate. That power is absolute, thoughtful of detail, 
orderly, provident, and gentle. It would resemble parental authority if, father-like, it tried to prepare its charges for a man's life, an adult life, but on the contrary, it only tries to keep them in perpetual childhood. It likes to see the citizens enjoy themselves, provided they think of nothing but enjoyment. It gladly works for their happiness, but it wants to be the sole agent and judge of it. It provides for their security, foresees and supplies their necessities, facilitates their pleasures, manages their principal concerns, directs their industry, makes rules for their testaments, and divides their inheritances. Why should it not entirely relieve them from the trouble of thinking and all the cares of living? Thus, it daily makes the f exercise of free choice less useful and rarer, restricts the activity of free will within a narrower compass, and little by little robs each citizen of the proper use of his own faculties. Equality has prepared men for all this, predisposing uh, them to endure it and often regarding it as beneficial. What the Tocqueville sees our country eventually collapsing into in the world, collapsing into, is the centralized and homogenous welfare state. So uh, he saw it coming. Now, why did he see it coming? And why did he predict that? And why does he say such uh, uh, pessimistic things about it? You'll see that that's much of what this course is about. Now, you yourself, you can make up yourself, by the way, for yourself, whether or not that describes uh, the direction of our country and indeed the direction of humanity. Uh, but it wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be inaccurate to say that in some ways if you've read, for instance, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, a, a, a technological science fiction novel of the future in which a technological society controls all aspects of life, which is a common trope in, in science fiction. Uh, de Tocqueville saw that coming. Well, how, did, how could he predict that that's what was coming? And if you tie that to the prediction that the United States, that the world would be divided in a hundred and so many years between the Russians and the Americans. Well, of course, we live in 2021 in which the Russians are still a power in the world, but nobody thinks that the 21st century is going to be a contest between Russia and America. Everyone knows it's going to be between China and America. And what you see is that you can easily take the Russians out of the Tocqueville's production prediction. And, and see that it, it works just as well with the Chinese, if not better, for reasons we'll see. So why did de Tocqueville think that the future of humanity would be divided up between these two countries? Because what he saw was two different versions of democracy. Um, and therefore, what he, and what he predicts is that America began in one version of democracy, and still is, but will eventually move in the direction of uh, the other kind of democracy, a kind of a radical egalitarian democracy. So uh, why he thought that and why he predicted that and what did he what he thought would bring that on and what in America would resist that, we will examine in this course. Uh, if you're looking at the notes, uh, let me finish my de Tocqueville introduction or framing this course by pointing to what I call in Roman numeral 2a from the notes from earlier this week, a Tocquevillian lens, a division of our political history into three parts. And the point of this is to kind of, first of all, make you aware of, I think you can divide our history into three parts. Um, uh, and, and that especially with respect to what the Tocqueville is seeing and commenting on, can say that, that we are, our history is, is in three, these three broad periods. What do I mean by that? First of all, there's pre de Tocqueville, de Tocqueville's America, that is to say the America of 1831, and post de Tocqueville. America, he came, remember, he came to America in 1830 and was studying it. So what's pre de Tocqueville in America? And this would be, of course, between 1776 and before 1776, uh, the colonial period, until 1830. I'll read from my notes. From 1776 and, of course, before, uh, the prenatal period of American life, until 1830, the country came into existence. 
its existence crystallized around openly declared principles, of course, as the to as Cropsey will say, the, the parchment regime, our first great parchment, our first parchment, the parchment that brought our nation into being, the Declaration of Independence. Openly declared principles. It experimented with various sets of institutional arrangements, first on the state, then the national level, culminating in the great constitutional reform of 1787. And you'll see, by the way, that in volume one of Democracy in America, this is what occupies the first part of volume one. It's essentially a geographical, an economic, a cultural, and an institutional history of how America came to be. Um, then it began to grow after 1787 and the constitution was ratified in 1788 and of course became functional in 1789, March 4th, 1789. Then it, then America, began to grow um, uh, territory with new territory, new states, population, the new constitution rapidly established the foundation of a prosperous, stable, and politically competent nature, nation. Bearing in mind that during the Articles of Confederation, as we'll see briefly, uh, that 11-year period between 1776 and 1787, which historians often call the critical period, it wasn't clear that the nation that had been born in the Declaration was going to succeed and survive. Um, many people at that point thought it was going to fall apart, and that what you're going to see in um, the North American continent was a plethora of warring uh, and competing societies and nations, just like in Europe. So uh, the Constitution changed all that, and it was a success. It, it did, in fact, move the nation forward, bound it together, into a, and turned it into a politically competent nation. Um, for instance, Hamilton the first great secretary of the treasury, we were a debtor nation, a terrible debtor nation, up until the time when the constitution went into effect and Washington appointed Hamilton as the secretary of the treasury. Within 10 years, he had not only erased all of America's state, national, and much of the private debt, America had become in 10 years, one of the wealthiest societies in the world. So the constitution worked in that sense, and the nation grew. Flawed, of course, in profound and tragic ways. Slavery was embedded in our institutional life and eventually led to the greatest civil conflict in our history. But the nation thrived, producing three generations of a new kind of human being called an American. That's from 1776 and before up until 1830. So what's the Tocquevillian America? That's from 1831 to 1865, for reasons you'll see. So when de Tocqueville came to study us, we had essentially become what we are as a regime. More about where the regime is in the second part of this second module. Um, um, he foresaw a, na a national war over race and, and generated in the tension between the slave and non-slave portions of the country. Um, Although he did not, it did not quite unfold in the anticipated, as you're going to see in uh, volume one, part two, chapter 10, he thought there would probably be a war, but between the races. Um, so, um, uh, as you're going to see, he foresaw that the question of slavery would be the great question that would tear the nation apart, but in different ways than he had foreseen. Um, uh, he also foresaw the expansion of the nation's population and territory and the growth of national government in terms of administrative centralization and control of the nation's life. As you're going to see, that, that last part is in the conclusion of volume one that I read earlier in module one, when he perceives this vast continental nation of millions, of, hundreds of millions of people swarming all over the place and uh, getting in line for Chick-fil-A chicken in the morning. Um, uh, he, he predicted that we would become a great and continental nation. Um, but he thought that that nation we had uh, had become could end. This is what, remember, he came to this country to see how democracy in America worked so that he could take that report back to Europe and can persuade the, the generation of his day that, that they shouldn't resist democracy they should welcome it because America showed that democracy could work as a decent and stable system of government. Um, and that's what that's why he came here and that's what he reported. Um, 
that he thought that America could stand as a as an example of decent democracy to a Europe and a world that had seen democracy as the French Revolution, which meant, as we saw, chaos, mob rule, evaporation of individual dignity, and the rule of law. But there's a post Tocquevillian America, and I would date that from the end of the Civil War to the present future. What do I mean by that? But the Tocqueville was not only an astute political analyst, that is to say, looking at the reality in front of him, what I called in the first module, and we'll come back to as his static analysis of the America that he saw. Um, he was a philosopher, as I've tried to suggest, of near great rank, uh, and understood human nature and its conditions with profound and uncanny insight. He grasped the novel character of modern democracy, and what that is we will come to understand much more fully, and saw how it would come to evolve in America or decay and therefore saw in the future of America, the future of humanity. His analysis of America folds, unfolds into practice. Now, what do I mean by a post to Tocquevillian America? Because what did the, the Civil War did change our, our nation and constitution. Um, first of all, um, uh, even though I, I argue in, uh, uh, that and we'll see this reflected in the storing book about the nature of the founding and the tension between the Articles of Confederation and what kind, what kind of change occurred between the Articles and the Constitution. To be brief and schematic, the Articles set up a confederation of sovereign states. The Constitution destroyed that old arrangement and created a national union of semi-sovereign states. Now we're gonna explore what that complicated word means semi-sovereign, um, and we'll see that in some ways the situation that the Tocqueville saw in 1830 um, was this interesting mix of semi-sovereign states and a sovereign nation. It's clear that the Civil War in some ways destroyed that, and don't forget, now don't get me wrong, the states still possess that kind of residual semi-sovereignty, but there's no question that in destroying uh, the, the Confederate States of America, uh, the national government assumed a military and an administrative power over the nation that in some ways he did see coming and did predict as the future of our country. But you'd have to say that the constitutional change that came in as a result of the war wasn't the 13th Amendment that eliminated slavery, that was important enough, but the 14th Amendment, which uh, 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 was came into effect because of course the former Confederate states refused to embody the regime change that the elimination of slavery had promised. And so the 14th Amendment put the civil rights and definition of state citizens under the administration of the federal government. And that has consolidated the power of the federal government as has, for instance, the growth of national commerce. And so as you're gonna see, uh, a theme that the Tocqueville introduces as a, a part of his dynamic analysis in uh, part one, is this question of centralization and decentralization. And he predicted that the course of modern American government in the future and all democracy would be towards administrative centralization and the greater and greater assumption of the functions of the society into the regular, regulatory um, and welfare dispensing apparatus of the state. So um, that's, uh, that's why I think the Tocqueville is critical for understanding American politics, both in terms of what he saw at his time and the enduring elements of American life that he analyzed and also how he predicted the unfolding of our institutional life. So let me uh, spend the rest of this module then turning in the notes because on my in the Zoom session, I thought I did okay an okay job of, of showing how I would use the lens of race as, as the link between de Tocqueville's analysis and the founding for that matter, and the completion of this course with the six authors that we'll read at the end. A seminar on how race and slavery and the founding played out, how it's now analyzed in de Tocqueville's work and how it still lives out in our life today. Um, so let me, um, uh, let me do a kind of, uh, in this one, a broad introduction to Cropsey, but then um, postpone our, our more um, uh, detailed discussion of the 
elements and structure of his article uh, until the third module uh, coming down the chute. Um, so uh, note, Cropsey begins his analysis of American life with observing two uh, separate but related puzzles that Americans seem to be in a constant state of flux and uncertainty about what we stand for as a nation at the same time that we seem to be involved in an intense form of self-criticism in which we don't like what we are. So we don't know what we are and we don't like what we are. That's the two beginning points of Cropsey's unfolding of his article. Um, and uh, as we'll see, by the way, by the time you're finished with this article, he turns those two surface questions about the nature of American political life into a broad reflection about what, what in fact uh, constitutes American politics. Um, and and uh, and in particular, as you're going to see, the question that that he kind of morphs these two surface questions into is not only um, uh, where America has come from and what are its constituent elements that lead up to our country and what are the elements of American politics as they've unfolded. He turns the great question in his essay is 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 American politics when you look at us overall and as historically, are we a jumble of uncoordinated elements, just a chance story of historical events unfolding, or is American politics a whole with coherent parts? And moreover, is there a coherent pattern to the unfolding of American politics, so much so that you can explain in broad strokes uh, what has happened and what will happen. Again, it's almost as if he's looking for the sheet music of, of American political life. So um, uh, um, I'll talk a little bit about his method uh, and, and, and how, he, how he works as an author and writer, a little bit more about him in the third module when we start unpacking his article. And that will probably take us into uh, some of our discussion in our next Zoom session on Monday night. But uh, one question he says is, how much of this dynamic that he's I isolated, the fact that Americans are in constant uncertainty about what we stand for as a nation, at the same time that we're constantly self-loathing and critical of ourselves. We don't know what we are and we don't like what we are. Again, those are the two questions he begins with. And, and since the title of the essay is The United States as Regime, uh, it's, let me finish the rest of this module then explaining what the concept of regime is. Now, if you've had ancient political philosophy, to some degree, if you've had modern political philosophy, or even American government, I've talked about this concept many times, because it's the key to my understanding of the study of politics as a political theorist or political scientist. So, um, if you're looking at the notes, this is on the second page at the top. So, uh, what is a regime when it, when it, when as Cropsey writes his essay, the United States as regime, what does that mean? What, it, what is a regime? Well, again, uh, let's begin conceptually, definitionally, and then analytically. The regime, uh, and first of all, let's describe the word regime and the two other synonyms that exist for it in England and where English and where they came from. Regime is a French word that comes from the French word regime, which derives from the Latin word rex, which is the word for king. And the reason it gets to regime and regal, re, uh, like royal and these kinds of things, all these words come from Latin. And it has to do with the way that Latin unfolds, that when you have a word like rex or dux, which is leader, uh, in when you go through the different uh, uh, declinations of the noun, in their older forms, it comes out, and it turns out the root of the Latin word rex uh, is actually reg. And actually, this goes back to ancient Indo-European because it turns out the Sanskrit word for king is raja, which also uh, uh, obviously is related to this Latin word. So the regime is the ruling thing, the thing that rules, the kingly thing that, that keeps things in order. The second word that is uh, 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 synonymous with it is the Latin word constitution. And that comes from um, uh, the Latin word stare is the root, as in the same as institution, 
Constitution. Stare means to stand. It's where our word stand, und stehen, auf Deutsch comes from. Um, and and the difference between institution, which means to set up, or institute means to erect or put together, or to set up would be the better word. Um, constitution comes from the Latin prefix cons, like in Spanish con, which comes from the prefix cum, which in Latin means with or together. So a constitution is an arrangement of institutions that hold the political system together. The third term comes from Greek, which is the source of much of our political vocabulary, politi, polity, which is actually a, a cognate. The Greek word is politeia, and the ultimate root of all of our words about politics, and, and if you've had me for ancient political philosophy, you know, you know this story, it comes from the Greek word for polis, which is the Greek word for city, but we actually is closer to what we mean by country or nation. So politeia, Greek polity, is the word for city or cityosity, like an abstraction. Uh, the analogy I use to psychology is, is what does psychology study? It studies the human person, but it does so by different theories or uh, versions of theories of personality. What is personality? It's the ality that makes you a person. And what psychology does in the study of personality is to try to generate, for instance, typologies of personal personality types. So as to do what? So as to explain why uh, you do what you do and how you are different from other persons. That's what in psychology, a theory of personality does. It explains the person, uh, how that person behaves and conducts him or herself and how they are different from other people. So each one of these three words, regime, uh, constitution, polity, they all refer to the same thing the overall political system of a country. Um, and again, uh, generally speaking, the word that we'll be using is following Cropsey is regime. This, the, the political system is regime. And by the way, but you could just say, say constitution, as Aristotle says, the six different kinds of regimes or constitutions from uh, the politics of Aristotle. And um, the, uh, uh, the confusion, of course, comes from the fact that we in America have a document called the Constitution. Now, as Aristotle points out, and, and all nations, all countries, all polices have a polity, have a constitution. Each human being, each person has a personality. Now, again, now, if, if, and again, just to beef up this analogy to psychology, you know, uh, there are different theories of personality depending on the theorists, like Freud, Jung, Etc. or even Plato. Uh, uh, and, and we'll see that will lead naturally to the next uh, topic of discussion, which is what are the parts or elements of a constitution, regime, or polity? More about that in a second. But um, so um, bearing in mind, therefore, that all political entities, all polices, all cities, all countries, nations, etc., all sovereign associations that we call the political association. All polities, all countries, all nations have a constitution. We, of course, were the first nation to have comprehensively a written constitution, where we tried to put our political existence down in a foundational document. Every nation has a constitution, but not every nation has a written constitution, although following the example of America, most of the 200 plus uh, members of the United Nations do have now written constitutions. So that's another reason for saying for the Cropsey that what you see in America and the tensions in American political life tend to be representative of the tensions of all modern political life and also bolster the fact that the reason that you can see in America and the future of America, the future of humanity, which is Tocqueville's whole analytical point, is because um, all modern politics derives from the same set of ideas that American politics derives from. Of course, every nation is different and everything, but to take Britain, for instance, Britain has a constitution, but it doesn't have a single written constitution. It has ruling elements, it has ruling uh, governing ideas and all those kinds of things we'll see. But um, um, not every nation has a written constitution, but we do, and so does almost all modern nations. So the concept of a constitution is the whole political system, the arrangement of offices, institutions, customs, and laws, 
and ideas that organize and distribute power in the society. Um, again, like the theory of personality answers in psychology, it explains why that particular type of person does what he or she does, it explains their behavior, and it also arranges the differences between different persons. The concept of a regime or a constitution does those the same thing. The constitution of a nation, its regime, its polity explains why that people in that nation behave politically the way they do, and it explains why that nation is different politically from another nation. So <clears throat> this concept is central to my understanding of political science. We will spend the bulk of our time in this class examining the nature, construction, and unfolding of the American constitution regime or, or system of government. So just to follow this analogy to personality theory a, a bit, if you're a Freudian, for instance, you see the human beings in front of you and you say, ah, what explains what they do is because their personality has three parts and elements. And if you have studied this psychology, you know that Freud thought that you were composed of three things, the ego, the id, and the superego. Now, those of you that have had Dr. Dunn in class know what a superego is, but let's not go there. So what did Freud mean by saying that the human personality was divided into three elements or functions? Well, there's the id, the part of our animal nature's instincts and, and drives that essentially are the real source of our behavior. Having uh, the, the idea that our human identity was just an overlay over our animal behavior. And then there's this thing called the superego, which Freud thought was our inherited and embodied notions of right and wrong that we absorb from our parents and uh, our society. Um, and, and of course, the problem is, is our, we, absorb, we absorb our sense of how to behave morally from our parents and society and our religions and all that stuff, which of course are an attempt to stuff our animal instincts and drives back in the jar and behave better than they, our pets, although I think our pets tend to behave better than we do, nevertheless. So Freud thought that there was this mediating consciousness of the self or the ego. Ego is just the Latin word for I. And that's how Freud explained the parts of personality. If you're Jungian, following Carl Jung, or, or different other theorists, or Plato. Plato thought the three parts of the soul, if you have an ancient political philosophy, are, of course, um, uh, uh, eros, thumos, and logos. Animal desires, spirited love of honor, and connectedness with society, and um, and the rational consciousness. Freud just didn't, you know, yank his three parts of human personality out of nowhere. He, of course, um, was a, a, a scholarly person. And But, of course, you see what I mean. So if, if personality is to person, what constitution is to a nation, what are the elements of a political system? Now, again, this is critical for us understanding the American political system and American politics. And, um, and, but it's also critical for the, the specific issue of addressing the contemporary controversies of race. As I said in, my, in our Zoom discussion and asked some of you, and in fact, I, I, I asked a question of all of you, which just jot down a paragraph or so in answer. If you believe that the concept of systemic racism or white supremacy, which are um, uh, weighted terms that are, have become essential elements of our contemporary conversation about race, um, if you believe that characterizes American politics, do you think it does so because we are a democracy or because we have failed to be a democracy? You will see as this course unfolds why I ask that question that way, even if you don't understand it now. But what I'd like you to do is before the end of the week or before our session on Monday is at least uh, try to answer that in some coherent thought and get it back to me so I can use it as part of our discussion. Now, um, so... In order to raise the question of whether there is such a thing as systemic racism, this was the point I was making on Tuesday, is you have to talk about what the political system is. So what are the parts of a political system? And it turns out there are four parts, going back to Aristotle and Plato and to Tocqueville too. First part is a set of ideas or governing or fundamental ideas. Shared view of human beings that provide the standards of justice, the goals of the nation. Every nation has certain governing fundamental sharing ideas. And the sharing of those ideals, every time you say the Pledge of Allegiance, means you're standing up and you're believing in American ideals. 
and following Cropsey, we have a document that states those ideas called the Declaration of Independence. It's the part that starts, we hold these truths to be self-evident. We as Americans hold these truths. And what's the first thing you learn? That all men are created equal. And so uh, as you're gonna see to some degree, that's what all modern democracies agree on, the notion of human equality. Second, each, set, each political system has a set of institutions that are embodiments of the governing ideas. Um, and they explain how structure, power is structured and arranged. You can see that in the Constitution. We have another document that does that. Um, third, those structures that embody the core ideas then govern. They pass laws and policies. It, they are, the laws and policies of a political system are the regime in action. Um, uh, for instance, the debate over the minimum wage. Why does that even appeal to human beings? It's because it raises the sense in which people are or should be or shouldn't be politically or economically equal. Uh, clearly, the minimum wage is an attempt to build in practice in the economic life of the country a certain kind of equality. So, so nations exist first as a set of shared concepts and ideas. Uh, and you're going to see the big change from ancient aristocracy to modern democracy is all aristocracies are based on the idea that human beings are not equal, that some human beings are superior to others. Our aristocracy comes from the Greek word aristos, which means the best. And so um, uh, modern democracy begins with the ass assumption and the proclamation of human equality. The, Constitution, for instance, people think that, for instance, the Constitution required you to be white, male, and a property owner. The Constitution actually says nothing about all those things. It was the first and most democratic Constitution in the history of the world. Because, for instance, to be a member of the House of Representatives, what are you required? You have to be 25 years old. You have to be a citizen for seven years and, and, um, and live in the state where you represent. No discussion of property, no discussion of line or nobility. No discussion of gender. In fact, uh, the only office in the Constitution that is restricted, that is, that in which any human being on earth couldn't occupy, is the presidency and vice presidency, since you have to be a native born citizen. But any human being born on earth can not only become an American citizen, can occupy. So that's pretty democratic because of the, the Constitution embodies the ideals of the Declaration. Not perfectly, of course. Third, we are governed by those laws. And last, the last part of the regime that we have a tendency either to exclude to the private realm, as, as Cropsey points out, or, uh, or, or shovel off to sociology or culture is the customs and, and actual kinds of human beings and characters that living in that country produces. Um, uh, so uh, I said my mother in action in the notes, it's because uh, my mother was at paid is bless her heart she's still alive as of this evening um and and she was an american and she loved her country and she made sure that we not only like washed our faces and changed our clothes but she taught us the pledge of allegiance she taught us what it meant to be an american so and again americans wear blue jeans and and um they say things like have a nice day so Americans are actually not just a, an institutional phenomenon, they're a cultural phenomenon. All of those four parts of political life, the core ideas, the governing and structural institutions, the laws and policies, and the kind of human beings that inhabit the place culturally are what constitutes the political system of a nation. And in the third module of this uh, uh, session, we'll explore how Cropsey then uh, directs our attention to the nature of the United States regime, its tensions and its unfolding.